Um, it's Jessica with Zoo Creates, and today I have Christina here with me. Um, today we're going to be making a fun craft that you can hang outside in your garden. Um, we are making what's called a mason bee house or an insect house, Christina. That'll be fun. Yes, it'll be lots of fun. So do you know what a mason bee is, Christina? I do not actually know what a mason bee is. A mason bee is a type of bee, and they are very, very, very small. We probably, you probably have them all over your backyard and just didn't realize that they were bees. They're really teeny tiny and unlike honeybees and wasps that make their own house, um, like honeybees will make a beehive um, and wasps will make a wasp nest, mason bees are called cavity nesters. So they need to find like something hollow to live in. So if you have a dead tree, they might live in there or if you have um, flowers that have died but have hollow stems, okay. they might live inside those. And so we're just gonna provide them with a really good um, habitat to live in because um, mason bees are really important to pollination along with a lot of different other kinds of insects and so we're gonna make a little house for them to have in our garden so to start with you need some kind of a jar so whether it's a soup can or a, a peanut butter jar um, these are some old craft jars that we've recycled here at the zoo you can also even just take a pot bottle and cut it in half and just use one of the halves of a pot bottle that would work really well too. Would a soda can work as well though? Yeah, I think a soda can would work. You might need to cut the top off and so of course that's something that we'd want parents to do yes. and not kids, um, but you could cut the top off. It, soda cans might be a little sharp so it kind of just depends on, okay. on um, uh, how sharp it is after you've cut it. But some sort of container that has an, a bottom, a solid bottom and an open top. So with our jars here, we're gonna take our lids off and we're gonna recycle those because we don't need those lids. And so now we have our lid that has a solid bottom and an open top and what you're going to want to do is on the bottom put a little nail hole and so Christina can show you how to do that this is something parents are going to want to do of course all right and then you pull it back out yeah, pull your nail back out I already put the nail hole in mine and so in that hole we're going to take a piece of string and this is what we're going to use to hang it so where would we hang this outside? So I will probably hang mine maybe um, from a tree or um, my parents have one that is hanging off of an, they live out in the country and so they have one that's hanging off of an old fence post. You could do that too. Or maybe somewhere in your garden where it's not um, in a lot of direct sunlight and gets and is a little shaded. Um, but that might be a good place, especially because if there's a lot of flowers around, then that's gonna provide the bees with a lot of food. So I'm just gonna make a quick knot in the top. All right, so there, that is how our bee houses are going to hang. I'm a little slower at knot time. <laughs> and then inside, we have to make a bunch of little cavities. And so cavities are just a hollow space of some kind. And so our bees like little hollow space, like almost like little tubes. And we're gonna make our little tubes out of newspaper. Now, if you don't have newspaper at home and you have some, just some white copy paper or if you have um, some brown paper grocery bags, those would work really well too. And so what we're gonna do is I'll give Christina a bunch of newspaper and it's really easy to tear up newspaper. So what we're gonna do is we're going to tear our newspaper in half first. And it doesn't have to be pretty, but this is something really fun for kids to do. And then we're just going to tear strips of newspaper that are about the same width as our, or length as our jars. So you might have longer strips if you're using a longer jar or smaller strips. And then once you get your strips torn, we'll get several of them torn here. Your strips are definitely nicer than mine. <laughs> they don't have, the bees aren't gonna care. They don't have to be pretty. But it's always a lot of fun. This is something that we give to, we give newspaper to a lot of the animals here at the zoo for enrichment. It's really fun for them to tear up newspaper, especially like our parrots, like our macaws that you find in the Discovery Center. They love to spread newspaper. So this would be a really fun activity for them to be involved in. All right, and once we have them ripped up, what do we yep. do? All right, now you're just gonna take your newspaper and you're gonna roll it into a tube. So you're just gonna roll them up. 
Now if you want to make sure they stay, you can always tape them, but I just kind of tend to stick them in there. And then as you get more, you're going, they'll fill up the space. So we're just gonna roll up all of our tubes. And you're just gonna put them in the space or inside your jar. You don't have to have it tight. In fact, it's better to not have them completely tight in there. Um, you wanna have some space. And then when we get done with filling our, uh, our jars up with um, newspaper, then um, we're gonna add some like tissue paper and some shredded paper just to give them some almost like little nesting materials for the, for the bees. All right. So bees are some, and other insects are something that we call pollinators. So can you talk a little bit about a, what a pollinator is, Christina? That I can. So a pollinator is kind of like an animal that they will use the nectar or the pollen that comes from a flower. So flowers, when you see them like dandelions, when they get all puffy at the end after being yellow for a while, those are their seeds. And the wind helps dandelions disperse their seeds or spread them around. So you get a lot of dandelions after the wind comes through. But not all of the flowers have wind to help move their seeds around. So when you have honeybees or you have birds that eat the seeds or use the pollen to make honey, all those different animals that utilize the flowers, they are using that pollen and spreading it around, helping other plants get uh, pollinated, helping it spread around so then more flowers can grow and more, plant, more animals can use those. Awesome. All right, so I think I've almost filled up mine. As you can see, I don't have a lot of um, open space, but I also haven't crammed it completely full um, of uh, newspaper. So what I'm going to do now that I have um, all of my newspaper tubes in, I'm just gonna kind of fill up some of those spaces with um, some tissue paper and some, I have some moss here that you can stuff in there. And this not only provides provides warmth for the insects. Um, it also provides some, um, just some nesting material as well as it makes it look pretty if you're using a see-through container like we are. Um, because since this is gonna be outside, there's not gonna be a lot of decorating that we can do just because it's gonna be outside in all sorts of different um, the weather elements. And so adding some brightly colored tissue paper is more for us than it is for the bugs. Do you think maybe some grass would also work to fill yeah, it? You could use grass, you could use maybe some flower petals that have fallen off of a flower to stuff in. Absolutely. Um, uh, tissue paper, even um, you could color pictures inside, you, like take some white copy paper and you could color a picture on it or just make some colorful pieces of paper to stuff in there if you don't have tissue paper at home. So I'm just gonna fill in all. This is some Easter grass that we got from the dollar store or you can always shred up paper um, if you have a paper shredder at home. Or if you're really bored, you could just cut up the paper into tiny pieces. Yeah, you could do that too. <laughs> Construction paper would work. Just kinda gonna fill in those holes for those bees. All right. Flying paper. And then, once you've gotten it stuffed with all sorts of materials, it's pretty much done. However, if you have the supplies at home, we're gonna paint the outside of ours since they are um, see-through. Well, since it is a clear, we're gonna paint the outside just to give it some decoration. Now the paint we're using today, we're using acrylic paint, which is not a washable paint, so it'll stand up a little bit better outside um, if it rains than, say, washable paint would. Um, but if you wanted to, you could even just paint with mud, and that might be a fun way to decorate your jar. Um, I think that'd be fun. Yeah, because every time it rains, it's going to get cleaned off, and then you get to paint it again. So it would be a really great activity. So we just have some paint here that we're going to do some designs. Like I might put a flower on mine. And with the mud, you could even see if you have different types of mud around your house, because is all mud the same color? No, it is not. That's a good point. So there might be some black mud, or you may have some brown mud. You might have some red mud or orange colored mud. You can also um, color mud and make mud paint. We do that a lot in some of our classes here at the zoo. We make mud paint um, by taking 
plain old mud, and we'll mix it with something colorful like we might mix it with um, food coloring or if we have some paint at, um, around, like we might use some tempera paint and just put um, paint in the uh, mud and it'll turn it different colors. Or you can also um, use like powdered paint or chalk even, and that would okay. turn mud different colors. And that would be lots of fun to, fun way to decorate. Because again, the mud's gonna wash right off, but um, it'll give you another activity to do on a different day. So I think you might have mentioned this earlier, but are those little mason bees the only guys who would use this, do you think? I don't think so. I think you'd find a lot of different insects living in here. I'm not entirely sure all the different kinds of insects that would call an insect hotel home, um, but I'm sure if you had it out there, something a fun activity would do um, to do would be to observe your mason bee house or your insect hotel, whatever you want to call it, um, for the different kinds of an um, insects. And you could even keep a bug journal, which would be really, really fun. Um, just uh, drawing pictures of the different types of bugs that you see um, and keeping track of how often it's getting used. And if you hang up your mason bee jar and you've been watching it and you're seeing that there aren't a lot of bugs coming to stay, maybe try moving it to a different part of your yard. Okay. I'd say maybe give it a couple of weeks before moving it around just because um, you may just not be there when, there's, when the bugs are coming. But um, that would be a fun activity to do while you're at home now right now it's a little cold outside so I was gonna mention that <laughs> do, do we see a lot of bugs when it's cold out uh, not that often would be my guess I tend to actually see them more in my house when it's cold than outside why are we seeing bugs more inside than outside right now because it's a little bit too cold for them outside right now so they find little ways to get into houses sometimes because they know houses are warm there's warmth because we like to stay warm we don't like to be cold like it is outside and so they'll find their way into our houses sometimes or into barns they probably like barns a lot or uh, sheds anywhere that they can get that's going to help protect them from the environment outside because when it's really cold bugs don't really have the best ability to stay alive when it gets too cold one thing when you are deciding where you're going to put your hotel is you're going to want to make sure it's not next to um, where there's going to be a lot of bird traffic because birds love to eat bugs. There's a lot of birds that are starting to show up now that love to eat bugs. And so that is, would not be... So don't hang it on your bird feeder? Yeah, probably not <laughs> hanging it on the bird feeder would be the best idea. So once you get your jar all decorated, you can let the paint dry and then you can hang it outside to make a nice little home for some of the bees in your garden to help pollinate your flowers. So, all right. And I believe we brought an animal friend with us today. Did we bring a mason bee? We did not bring a mason bee. Those guys are a little tiny and hard to find, and we don't have one in our education. <laughs> all right. Well, while you're getting our animal friend out, I'll clear off our table. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. So I might not have brought a mason bee, but I did bring another animal that could be considered a pollinator. So there's a lot of different animals that can be pollinators. As we mentioned, uh, a lot of insects are good pollinators as well as the birds are going to be great pollinators. But one that people maybe don't think about are, oh, she wants to let go real quick, maybe. Come on, girl. There we go. Are lizards. Why do you think a lizard would be a pollinator? Hmm, well, usually when we think of lizards, maybe people think of lizards that like to eat bugs, but there's a lot of lizards that like to eat plants, right? That is true. So this lovely lady is Marcy. She is our blue tongue skink. These guys can be found in Australia, and the cool thing is these guys are herbivores, which means that they love their plants. She can also eat some bugs and some small little mammals here and there, uh, but plants are going to be her primary thing that she loves to eat. So let me correct that. That would make her an omnivore, not an herbivore. That's my bad. Uh, but she loves her plants, so fruits would be a way that she would be a pollinator. She eats a raspberry with all those seeds on it, and then she goes to the bathroom. Those seeds get spread. 
All right, and now um, with uh, reptiles, so like we know with, with bees, like bees are really fuzzy, mm -hmm. and so when they're going and collecting, um, when they're going to get nectar from all the flowers, we know that the pollen gets stuck on the bees because they're so fuzzy. Now, if she was going to eat a flower, and how would pollen get stuck to her? Because she's not fuzzy. What's she's covering not, her body? She is covered in something called scales, so you can kind of see the looks of her scales on her back. Hers are a little bit more snake-like than most lizards. Uh, but her scales have little bumps and edges all around them. It's kind of like if you see fishes or if you see fish and have all those little scales on them, a lot of people know that fish have scales. That's very similar to what uh, lizards have covering their body. So that pollen or, um, or flower nectar, all that stuff could get stuck to the little bumps on her scales. And so when she goes to another flower, it's going to get deposited in the other yes. flower. Okay. So it's kind of like the fuzzy legs, but instead they get stuck in between her scales. Awesome. Now, did you say what kind of, of lizard? she was she is a blue tongue skink and she's doing a great job of showing you why she's well I say that there we <laughs> go. she's doing a great job of showing you why uh, she's called a blue tongue skink because she has a blue tongue it is not because she likes to eat all those blue raspberry popsicles I promise uh, her blue tongue is naturally that color and it's a good way in Australia to tell other animals that maybe they should back away from her why do you think blue would be a way to that would tell animals to back off. Hmm. Well, I know that we have poison dart frogs in the Discovery Center and some of them are blue. So to, could it be possibly that she might be poisonous? That is a great guess. It could be that she's poisonous and that is what she is hoping the other animals think as well. Typically in the wild, bright colors are a way to tell other animals that I am poisonous and you really don't want to eat me or I have toxins in me. Something's going to make you sick if you eat me. But Marcy here, she is not actually poisonous toxic anything. She is what is called a mimicker. So she is pretending to be poisonous so animals will leave her alone. And so when she gets scared, what she'll do is she'll stick that tongue out and she'll make it really, really wide. So then she has a really big blue object in the animal's face and that can scare them because they're automatically going to think, oh, she's poisonous like those poison dart frogs. Now, is she the type of lizard that might live up in the trees or would she live more on the ground? That is a great question. Uh, as you see with the way she walks, she would probably be a better ground lizard than a tree lizard. As you see, she has tiny little kind of short stubby legs. Uh, they do a great job of allowing her to slither or walk really slowly and uh, low on the ground, but they would not help her in climbing very well. She can climb kind of up rocks or around branches and all this, but climbing up a tree, she would not do very good at. All right. Well, thank you, Marcy, for coming to Zoo Creates today. And thank you all. If you have questions, like you need um, an idea for an alternate um, supply that, um, like if we had something that you didn't have at home and you have questions of um, how you could substitute something, please put those in our comments. Um, we'd love to hear you. We'd also love to see pictures of your mason bee jars when you're done, um, when they're out hanging in your garden. We'd love to see those pictures. So you can post those in the comments as well and we look forward to seeing you guys again um, on Wednesday for our next Zoo Creates so thank you thanks